Welcome back to TFT Central. Today we're going to be going through the best settings for the ASUS ROG Swift PG32 UCDM. I had loads of requests for this one. My apologies in advance that we had to send the unit back very soon after the review was published, so we didn't have chance to record this video using the actual on-screen menu, but we've made do using some screenshots and we'll talk you through the settings that you should be able to follow easily enough anyway. So we're going to start off in the first gaming section. Here you can turn on variable refresh rate if you want to use that for gaming, obviously. If you find that you get any flicker, particularly on darker content, then you may want to disable that setting here, but otherwise use that if you like. The ELMB mode, extreme low motion blur, can only be used when you're using 120 hertz as an input. So with this being a 240 hertz screen, we don't really recommend using this unless you're going to game specifically at a lower refresh rate. So it might be handy if you can't quite power the screen at 4K 240Hz. If you're going to run at 120Hz maximum anyway, then by all means drop that in your graphics card control panel down to 120Hz. And then you could in theory enable ELMB, which will give you a boost in motion clarity on top of that. You will get a much lower brightness. It's not great as a feature. It's not particularly versatile or flexible, but experiment with that if you want to. The Game Plus section includes all of the usual stuff like frame rate counters, crosshairs, that kind of thing. Obviously use those if you want. The Shadow Boost setting might be useful if you're playing some darker content, but we did find that it raised blacks as well as raising that near black detail. So it's not ideal, but if you're going to be playing in dark and room conditions and lots of darker games, you may want to experiment with that setting as well. There's one setting that we're going to change here in the gaming menu, and that's to change the game visual mode to user. So that will give us full access to all of the settings, all of the RGB controls and that kind of thing for calibration. So let's move game visual over to the user mode. And then beyond that, most of the settings that we're going to adjust are in the image and the color sections. So for SDR content, you've got two choices really. You can either operate with an sRGB gamut, which is designed for SDR content and will give you a higher level of accuracy for SDR. Or you can run with the screen's full native wide gamut mode if you prefer. So if you like the more vivid and saturated colors, if you're gaming and watching movies more and you don't mind the oversaturation, then by all means stick with the full native gamut. If you're more focused on SDR accuracy, then you can switch to the sRGB mode. So the main setting that we're going to change will be in the color menu, where we're going to select between the display color space of the wide gamut, which will give you the full native mode, or sRGB. So this is the best place to operate the sRGB color clamp if you want to use that as well, rather than use the sRGB cal mode that's in the game visual menu. So you can choose the color space here between wide and sRGB. So first of all, let's set it up for sRGB mode. So we've selected sRGB as the color space. We can leave the color temp set on its default 6,500K. We can leave gamma set on its default 2.2. That's going to be optimal and it's well set up and well calibrated out of the box anyway. Back in the image section, the only thing we'll need to change here is we'll want to enable the uniform brightness mode. So that will stop any ABL dimming during SDR content and will maintain a consistent and reliable brightness across the screen, regardless of the content you're seeing and regardless of your window sizes and, and as you move documents around and that kind of thing. So enable uniform brightness here. And then for the brightness setting itself, we like to move this down to a setting of 42, which will give you a luminance of 120 nits. Alternatively, you could set this at 55 for 150 nits, or maybe 75 for 200 nits. The maximum that this will reach if you move it all the way up to a setting of 100 is 265 nits with that uniform brightness mode enabled. So for the sRGB mode, we've just changed the color gamut to an sRGB, We've left color temp and gamma on the defaults, and then we've just altered the brightness setting after enabling uniform brightness. The alternative mode then is to change the color gamut setting back to the wide mode, and that will operate the full native gamut of the panel. Then in this section, we're gonna to want to change the color temperature to the user setting. And then once we've done that, change the RGB settings to 98 for red and leave 100 for green and blue. So 98, 100, and 100. That will return you a white point very close to D65 or 6,500 Kelvin. And then we'll leave gamma set on 2.2 as that's very accurate out of the box anyway. And then back in the image section, we're gonna change the brightness again. 
So enable the uniform brightness here to avoid any kind of ABL dimming for desktop usage. And then the brightness setting can again be set to 42 to give you 120 nits, 55 for 150 nits, or 75 for 200 nits. Or you can move it all the way up to the maximum 265 nits for 100% if you'd rather. Set this to whatever you prefer for your own personal room conditions and ambient lighting. If you're using the wide gamut mode, then you might also want to try out our calibrated ICC profile that's linked in the description below. That can be useful if you're going to want to clamp the wide color gamut back to sRGB within color aware applications like Photoshop and so on. That might also help improve some of the near black detail that we found was a little bit problematic on this screen and couldn't easily be adjusted by any of the settings in the on-screen menu. So do check out the ICC profile that's linked below as well if you want. When you enable HDR from Windows or from a compatible device, then in the image section, you'll see that the HDR setting is now enabled. Most of the other settings are actually grayed out now. Within the HDR menu, you can choose between HDR console, movie, gaming, or true black. There's very minimal difference between the console, gaming, and movie modes, other than that the roll-off point of the luminance is slightly different. We think the gaming mode is likely to be optimal for most people, but do experiment with them if you like. They're all quite similar in terms of their brightness and their PQ tracking. The HDR400 True Black mode will cap your peak brightness at around 470 nits, so that's going to be more restrictive for HDR content. So we'd probably recommend using one of the other modes, but by all means experiment with them in, within HDR content. As a reminder, we'd only recommend enabling HDR when you're actually going to view HDR content whether that's an HDR game or an HDR movie, don't leave Windows running in HDR mode all the time. Within the system menu, there's a couple of things that we might want to have a look at here. So the USB-C charging, unless you specifically want to use USB-C charging at up to 90 watts, we'd recommend leaving that at its default setting of 65 watts. Otherwise, you'll find that it limits your maximum brightness range. If you enable it to 90 watts, you can actually only change the brightness slider now up to 65 maximum, which will give you about 180 nits maximum luminance. So only enable that if you specifically need to use it. We'd leave the proximity sensor turned on here as well. That's quite useful. It will detect whether you're in front of the screen and using it. Otherwise, it will just turn the screen off temporarily until it detects you back. So that's quite handy as an additional OLED care option. Speaking of OLED care options, they are available in the on-screen menu, but we're showing a screenshot here of ASUS's Display Widget Center software. You can change the different settings here if you want. The Adjust Logo Brightness setting can help dim logos and HUD elements and that kind of thing on the screen. We'd recommend enabling as many of these features as you can for OLED care and maintenance, but if you find that problematic at all during usage, then you can turn that off. The pixel cleaning cycle can be run manually if you want, or it will prompt you periodically to run that. So it's probably best just to leave that as it is. The screen saver setting is quite useful. That will dim the screen if it detects that it's not being used or if there's a lot of static content being shown. So probably enable that one as well. But if you find it problematic or if you find it dimming during your normal desktop usage, then you can also disable that here. The final setting that's shown at the bottom here is the screen move setting. Now you can turn that off fully on ASUS's model. So if you find it distracting, shifting the pixels around every now and again, then by all means turn that off. But if you can leave that turned on, maybe at one of the lower settings, if you find it distracting, that will also help mitigate the risk of image retention and that kind of thing. So that should be the screen setup for both SDR and HDR usage. Let us know in the comments section below if you've got any questions. Our apologies again that this wasn't a walkthrough video guide of the actual menu itself. We no longer have access to the screen, so that was not possible to record. If you've enjoyed this video, please give us a quick like below. Thank you for watching, and we'll catch you next time.